What you listening to, son? I don't think you like it. Well, why not? I like this new generation of music. Science has, in fact, discovered God. And you can talk to the hardline atheists, and they will say, it looks like science has indeed discovered God. Oh, How would that God, be? God, it's all toilet sounds. Scientists are usually less religious than the general population, and that makes sense, given that the foundational ideas of many religions aren't exactly evidence-based, and scientists are trained to base their conclusions on hard evidence. Still, though, many scientists hold some kind of faith. Sometimes even highly credentialed and accomplished scientists are very religious. But does that make them right? Of course it doesn't. But given their intelligence and education, shouldn't those scientists have some strong, rational arguments for their faith? Well, in the case of three scientists, that's what we're about to find out. We'll start with an argument for the biblical God's existence from Gerald Schroeder, a Jewish physicist with a doctorate from MIT. If you take the trouble of going to the web and, and they're typing WMAP, the initials for, for a satellite, it's a diagram that shows the development of the universe from the creation over time. It's a timeline. Every word on that diagram comes from the NASA site. It is the condensed knowledge of the scientific community of how the universe created and how it got to where we are today. We see here, most amazingly, that on the extreme left edge, it shows a beginning to the universe. So look what science has discovered. We can create the universe from absolute nothing, provided we have the, the, the forces of nature. Now the laws of nature, the forces of nature aren't physical, they act on the physical. So if they create the universe, that means they predate the universe. So now we have a set of forces, we call them the laws of nature, that are not physical, that are able to act on the physical, they create the physical from absolute nothing. And they predate the universe, which means they predate our understanding of time. Put that together, it sounds very familiar. If you haven't noticed it, that's the biblical definition of God. What's so special about these forces and this God that allows them to be equated so definitively that proving the existence of one proves the existence of the other? Is it that the biblical God, Yahweh, is the only religious concept which has these qualities? It can't be, because the Vedic concept of Brahman possesses all of these traits. Is it that Yahweh is the first spiritual entity described this way? It can't be, again, because Brahman was being written about at least a few hundred years earlier. Ultimately, though, the reason this argument should not lead us to believe in Brahman or Yahweh is that it commits an association fallacy. It makes an irrelevant association in order to say that the qualities of one thing are necessarily the qualities of another. It makes the mistake of granting that any conceivable entity that possesses some of the qualities of this set of forces possesses all of the qualities of this set of forces, including existence necessitated by science. By that logic, though, any entity we just make up, which we say possesses the qualities of this set of forces, exists. This argument just leads to absurdities and does not prove any god's existence. Unfortunately, Dr. Schroeder seems pretty convinced by it even with its blatant flaws. The next argument we'll look at is a defense of Christianity against the problem of evil, or specifically suffering. It comes from John Lennox, a well-known professor of mathematics, so not technically a scientist, sorry, at Oxford University. In case you need a refresher, the problem of evil is wrapped up in this quote from Epicurus. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? then why call him God? First of all, it seems to me atheism doesn't solve it. It solves it in an intellectual sense that people say, like Dawkins, the universe is just like you'd expect it to be, when at bottom there's no good, no evil, no justice, and we just have to face it. Well, if that is correct, of course, it means you've solved the problem, you've removed it in some sense, but what you haven't removed is the suffering and the pain. So I find that philosophically a disaster. But now, in order to respond to it as a Christian, I have to come down to the heart of the Christian faith. And this is the very short answer. At the heart of the Christian faith, there stands a cross. And if that really is God there, then it tells me that God hasn't remained distant from this problem, but has himself become part of it. And the cross and the resurrection together seem to me to do what atheism's solution to this problem doesn't do. They give us grounds for hope. And 
I face a universe, as Michael does, that presents a mixed picture. But I would say this, we will never solve the problem philosophically of what a good God should, would, might, could, etc., have done. So we've got a problem. And as a mathematician, if you can't solve one problem, you ask a different one. And the different question for me is, granted that it's like that, is there anywhere in the universe evidence that there's a God that we could trust with it? And I believe there is, as revealed in Jesus Christ. That's my short answer. Lennox is right to say that atheism solves the problem philosophically, but the point he goes on to make does not help Christianity's case in respect to this issue. The fact that atheism does and says nothing about suffering in the world doesn't make it less of a solution to the problem of evil. Conversely, Christianity trying to alleviate some suffering in the world makes it no better of a solution to the problem. If it both proactively and retroactively eliminated all suffering in the world, it would solve the problem but it doesn't do those things. It doesn't matter whether Christianity gives one grounds for hope. The fact remains that when it comes to the problem of evil, Christianity doesn't hold up. Now, Dr. Lennox seems to acknowledge that Christianity can't solve this problem, but he admittedly goes on to believe in a god which is logically incoherent. I obviously can't say for sure, but it seems to be an emotional decision. If that's the case, I wish he'd just be more upfront about it. Next up, we have an argument for God's existence by Francis Collins, who is undeniably brilliant and accomplished. He's a physician and geneticist who led the Human Genome Project as director of the National Human Genome Research Institute. He's been elected to the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences, and has received the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of Science. He's also an evangelical Christian. So let's see how he argues for God's existence. And interestingly, some of the pointers to God had been in front of me all along, coming from the study of nature. And I hadn't really thought about them, but here they were. Here's one which seems like an obvious statement, but maybe it's not so obvious. There is something instead of nothing. No reason that should be. Why should mathematics be so unreasonably effective in describing nature? Hmm. There's the Big Bang. The fact that the universe had a beginning, as virtually all scientists are now coming to the conclusion, and of course that presents a difficulty because our science cannot look back beyond that point, and it seems that something came out of nothing. Well, nature isn't supposed to allow that. So if nature is not able to create itself, how did the universe get here? Another thing I began to realize by a little more reading is that there is this phenomenal fine-tuning of the universe that makes complexity and therefore life possible. You can't look at that data and not marvel at it. It is astounding to see the knife edge of improbability upon which our existence exists. So what's that about? Well, I can think of three possibilities. First of all, maybe theory will someday tell us that these constants have to have the value they have, that there is some a priori reason for that. Most physicists I talk to don't think that's too likely. There might be relationships between them that have to be maintained, but not the whole thing. A second possibility. Perhaps we are one of an almost infinite series of other universes that have different values of those constants. And of course, we have to be in the one where everything turned out right or we wouldn't be having this conversation. So that's the multiverse hypothesis, and it is a defensible one, as long as you're willing to accept the fact that you will probably never be able to observe those infinite series of other parallel universes. So that requires quite a leap of faith. The third possibility is that this is intentional, that these constants have the value they do because that creator God who is a good mathematician, also knew that there was an important set of dials to set here if this universe that was coming into being was going to be interesting. So take those three possibilities, and which of them seems most plausible? Apply Occam's razor, if you will, which says that the simplest explanation is most likely correct. Well, I come down on number three. Essentially, what Dr. Collins does here is compile some observations about the universe. There's something said of nothing, math works effectively, the universe has a beginning, and the physical constants of the universe exist in such a way which allows for life as we know it. He then submits a hypothesis as an explanation behind all of those things, a god. The way he defends it is to compare it to other hypotheses and apply Occam's razor. 
there are a couple of problems with this. One, he says that the simplest explanation is one that invokes an omnipotent being with creative will and intent, rather than saying that there's a force or law which simply had sufficient power and opportunity, not will, to bring all of this about. Two, he engages in special pleading to justify his choosing God over the other explanations mentioned. What he says about the multiverse hypothesis should be applied to the God hypothesis as well, but it's not. So that's the multiverse hypothesis, and it is a defensible one, as long as you're willing to accept the fact that you will probably never be able to observe those infinite series of other parallel universes. So that requires quite a leap of faith. Like the good scientist he is, Dr. Collins should realize that his hypothesis is not actually testable, so acting as if it's confirmed is not justifiable, just like it's unjustifiable to act as if the multiverse hypothesis is confirmed. It seems that, for some reason, Dr. Collins is using different standards and methods to determine God's existence. In researching for this video, I didn't just want to find ways to discredit all of these arguments. I wanted to understand why scientists believe in God at all, and I found that Dr. Collins actually sheds light on this issue. But faith in its proper perspective is really asking a different set of questions, and that's why I don't think there needs to be a conflict here. Uh, the kinds of questions that faith uh, can help one address are more in the philosophical realm. Why are we all here? Why is there something instead of nothing? Is there a God? Isn't it clear that those aren't scientific questions and that science doesn't have much to say about them? But you either have to say, well, those are inappropriate questions and we can't discuss them, or you have to say we need something besides science uh, to pursue some of the things that humans are curious about. For me, that makes perfect sense. He's right that there are questions out there that science can't answer and will probably always remain philosophical. But certain elements of scientific thought and practice can carry over into the examination of some of those questions, the God question being one of them. We can still require claims to be well-evidenced, or at least testable, before we accept them. We can recognize confounding factors which undermine the reliability of our personal feelings and experiences. We can check our work against the collective knowledge of logical fallacies. Science can't answer every question, but that's no reason to be any less critical or exacting when examining questions outside of science. I suspect that a key factor which contributes to the religiosity of scientists is one that contributes to the religiosity of the general population, that being our ability to compartmentalize, to put certain ideas or beliefs into mental compartments, sometimes where they remain unaffected by new information, ideas, or beliefs. This allows us to hold one belief, say a belief in a creator god, that remains unaffected while we extol contrary ideas, such as skepticism of untestable hypotheses. If it's not apparent enough already, compartmentalizing even core beliefs doesn't make you stupid. The men we've talked about here are all brilliant, just mistaken. Everyone does this. People who laugh at anti-vaxxers for denying science yet are themselves young earth creationists. People who understand why personal anecdotes are not reliable data yet are convinced of their own religious experiences. People who scoff at cult leaders and snake oil salesmen yet believe the words of ancient prophets. I myself used to do all of those things, and I'm not any smarter now that I don't. My point to all of this is to say that being right doesn't make you smart, and being wrong doesn't make you stupid. The consistent, cordial approach to a variety of topics on my channel exists to help smart people break down some of the compartments in their mind so they can be more rational across the board. I'm also here to help people, smart or not, realize that being right doesn't make them superior, and if they want to remain consistently rational, they'll have to take that idea out of its compartment and engage cordially with the rest of us. Thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. If you want to hear the story of how I stopped compartmentalizing my religious beliefs and became an atheist, I covered that in my fourth ever video on YouTube, and I still think it's actually a pretty good watch, so the link is in the description. As always, praise be unto Adam, my top patron and personal lord and savior for making this video possible. Go ahead and subscribe, check out my Patreon, follow me on Twitter and Facebook at GM Skeptic, join my Discord, and until next time, stay skeptical.